Hello and welcome to our next reflection on the life of St. Francis of Assisi. We carry on with where we left off, and that is that the number of the brothers increases to 12, including Francis. The question that arises for him is, what do I do with these people who come to me for guidance? Uh, these people are leaving everything behind and live alongside me. Uh, what is the be best course of action? Francis decides, I will go to the Pope. And so this band of brothers goes to meet Pope Innocent III. They are lucky to enlist uh, the help of a couple of bishops, including the Bishop of Assisi, who meets them in Rome, who enable them to gain access to the Pope. What St. Francis is presenting to the Pope for approval is a simple form of life, a way of life. Essentially, a gathering of a few texts from the Gospels and maybe a few other directives. Uh, but it is a Gospel way of life. St. Francis was not interested in what happened before. He's not interested in the monastic tradition that was already there. He feels that the Lord is starting something new. He is inviting him to lead a new way of life. And so he presents this to the Pope and asks for his blessings. He asks for his guidance. Pope Innocent III approves. There is nothing on paper, but we know that the visit took place either in 1209 or 1210. And the Pope approves. He gives him his blessing and to the brothers. Uh, and so this oral approval uh, is the beginning of this new way of life for Francis and his brothers. Uh, Francis then returns with his brothers, rejoicing, and they encounter poverty. They encounter an experience of lacking things in their way of life. Remember, they are essentially a group of wandering preachers, moving from place to place. They are relying on the work of their hands to support themselves. Many a time this is not enough, and so they rely on begging, begging for alms from the people that they encounter. Many times again this is also not enough, and so they are seeking shelter, they seek food. But the stories related to us by Thomas of Celano also present a picture of divine providence watching over them. And so on this return journey, lacking food, uh, they encounter suddenly from nowhere this man uh, who is carrying some bread. He gives it to them, and as soon as he leaves the bread with the group of brothers, he disappears out of their sight. So those providential moments that increase the faith of the early brothers, that increase their faith uh, in that divine watching over them, so that they are affirmed in their way of life, that actually they don't need much. Everything that they will need will be provided for them by God. And that's the main intention. And so they want to live this poverty precisely because they want to be closer to the Lord. And that's why they move on from one place to another. They are not stationary. They are not monks. And they are meant to be on the move. They are meant to preach this good news to others as well. And so what happens is that so many people <clears throat> begin to follow Francis, begin to be attracted to his way of life. And Thomas of Celano presents a picture of men, of women, of religious, of secular priests, wishing to hear, wishing to encounter Francis. Both the simple people, the uneducated ones, as well as the educated ones, are impressed by his knowledge, are touched by his words. Uh, this is a man who speaks from the heart. 
who uses simple language, who repeats the message of the gospel, who doesn't flatter anybody, who tells things as they are, who is asking people to leave their sins behind, who is inviting them to penance and preaches to them the message of peace. Many people are attracted to that. And as Thomas of Celano points out to us, St. Francis will write a rule of life for all of them. Both the women, uh, whom we have heard about already, the poor ladies will receive their rule of life from St. Francis. The brothers, as we have heard today, already at the beginning stage, have a little simple way of life. Uh, but they will also receive uh, a fuller, more up-to-date rule of life later on. And the lay people, those who cannot leave their families behind, and yet feel attracted to this man, feel attracted to his message, and want to live in the spirit of that message. He also writes to them in his letters to all the faithful. We will talk about the writings of Assisi in different series uh, of talks. Uh, but it's important for us to realize that St. Francis is providing for all these people. He is responding to their desire uh, to learn from him, to follow his example, to come closer to Christ. And so this new way of life is being awakened in the hearts of others. For his brothers, though, he has a very specific name. They are to be known as the Order of Lesser Brothers. In today's language, we are known as the Order of Friars Minor. The Lesser Brothers. It's an important title for Francis. Because for Francis, it encapsulates the identity of who we are and of what our mission is to the Church and to everyone about us. They both caps, uh, capture the relationship that we are asked to leave, uh, to live by. Uh, to be a brother uh, means that we are equal. So often we say we're more, some are more equal than others. But in the eyes of God, we are all equal. The differences come in the fact that we all have different roles to fulfill. Uh, we have different duties to fulfill, different gifts to put into use. But we are all brothers and sisters. That's a fundamental understanding of Francis of Assisi that we will hear more about later on. But he sees himself as a brother. A title that overcomes many of the obstacles, many of the hindrances that come between people, many distinctions. Christ has done away with all those. We are all his children, we are all his brothers and sisters. And then he qualifies that even further. Uh, we are to be lesser brothers. And that's an important qualification. Uh, humility has to go hand in hand with minority, with that quality of being lesser. And that means the spirit of doing our service as best we can, uh, but without thinking for at any moment that this is ours, that somehow I have achieved something. Whatever I am able to do, I do because of the gift of God working in me. It's not mine. It is the Lord who is at work. My mission is to bring people to the Lord, not to bring people to myself. And so a lesser brother doesn't draw attention to himself, he draws attention to the Lord. 
unless a brother will realize that everything is a gift from the Lord. And that brings a tremendous sense of freedom. If you are a workaholic and you find yourself sometimes thinking and feeling that your worth is due to what you produce or what you achieve or how much you have done, uh, then St. Francis has the cure for you. He is reminding you that's not true. Your worth is simply in the fact that you are created by God and this is who you are. You are a brother and a sister to everyone else. It's not about how much you work. That's not the source uh, of your worth. St. Francis has the answers, uh, and we can learn so much simply by meditating on those two words, a lesser brother. How can I be a lesser brother? How can I be a lesser sister in my way of life? Whatever that state of life may be. Remember, St. Francis of Assisi is not just for the brothers. It's not just there for my sake. Uh, as one who professes to live by the rule of St. Francis. St. Francis is for all people. He is an example to all of us. And so this group of lesser brothers journeys from one place to another. They happen to go to a place called River Torto, a little hut so small that Thomas of Celano describes it as too small for them even to stretch their legs properly to be able to sleep together under this one roof. And yet, they are full of joy. They are full of patience. Uh, their reality, their outlook on life is so different uh, to other people's. They are actually rejoicing uh, in this life of poverty, when they are wanting so many things. And yet their desire for God is greater than all these things. And that is why they are so at peace and happy wherever they are. And the story goes that a man comes with a donkey and goes into the hut and pushes the donkey inside and says, well, we'll make a great place here for ourselves. Maybe he thought he could join up forces uh, with the brothers or whatever. As soon as St. Francis hears it, he tells the brothers, let us go. And they leave the place behind. He does not wish to even give the impression that he is attached to a single place. Whatever the place may be, it's just a passing place. It's only a place. He moves on and he is prepared to let go of everything that he has there and moves on to another place. That sense of poverty gives them great freedom. Because in that poverty they are not worried about the things they have. They are not worried that someone will take those things away from them because They've got very little that could be taken away from them. So they're not worried about thieves, because the thieves will find very little to take from them. All these cares, all these worries, they are simply freed from. And so moving from River Toruto, they go to the Porciuncula, that little place that St. Francis renovated. That was the third church that St. Francis restored. And here he teaches them to pray. He teaches them to pray the Our Father. And the following sentence that we say so many times in our churches. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Amen.